to everybody here and uh, a special welcome to our trustees of the Qatar Fund and especially to uh, Cyrus Barron who is here with us today to represent the WZO Trust Funds um, who have set up this lecture. I, I would like to welcome everybody here, um, colleagues, friends, ladies and gentlemen. This is the 25th Kuta Memorial Lecture. The full title is Dastur Dr. Sorab Hormazji Kuta Memorial Lecture, which we are holding here at SOAS. As some of you may be aware, the annual Kuta Memorial Lecture Series was set up in the late 1990s by the late Dr. Shirin Bonu Kutar through the good offices of the late Shapur Captain and the World Zoroastrian Organization. She endowed it in memory of her husband, Dastoji Kutar, who served as a high priest of the Zoroastrians of Europe from 1965 until his death on the 20th of April 1984. Since 1998, we have been holding the lecture series here at SOAS in his memory, at the time around his death anniversary. And we are delighted that you are all here with us tonight for this very special occasion, the 25th uh, lecture, a silver anniversary. It is my great pleasure and privilege to welcome our speaker tonight, Dr. Mehabot uh, Kanisadeh. Mehabot comes from a Zoroastrian family for, of Kerman. He started his career with a PhD in veterinary medicine at the Azad University, Tehran, in 2004. And this was followed by a Master of Science in Animal Pathology at Utrecht University in the Netherlands in 2007. Subsequently, however, Mehabot decided to change career and study his ancestral culture and tradition, completing a Master's of Arts in Ancient Culture and Languages at Shahid Beheshti University in Iran in 2010. And this then brought him to SOAS, where he did an MA in Religions of Asia and Africa in 2013, focusing on Zoroastrianism, Avestan, and Pahlavi. And this was then followed by a PhD at SOAS on the Pahlavi version of the Homyasht in 2018. Then in 2018, Mehabud also took up a postdoctoral fellowship in the ERC-funded Multimedia Yasna project to work on the Avestan version of the Home Yasht. And in 2022, he was awarded an early career fellowship of the UK Arts and Humanities Research Council, a position which he is currently holding here at SOAS. Now, it is a very special pleasure for me to see Mehabud presenting the Qatar Memorial Lecture tonight. He is one of my first students at SOAS, and I have followed his academic development over the years with great joy and pride. Apart from being an excellent scholar and a much-loved teacher, Mehabud is also an outstanding example for our collaboration with the Zoroastrian community. And I am immensely proud to have a, a, a Zoroastrian from Iran as my student. <laughs> Not only is he, he a member of it, of the Zoroastrian community, but the Zoroastrian Trust Funds of Europe, along with seven other grant giving bodies, have supported his MA and his PhD studies at SOAS as support for which we are profoundly grateful. Mehrabot has published a series of important articles in top journals, including the Bulletin of the School of Oriental and African Studies, significantly contributing 
to the work of the um, also he has to significantly significantly contributed to the work of the multimedia Yasna project uh, and especially on to its film and the online publications. His book on the Avestan version of the Home Yasht is expected to go into print at the end of this year. And his second book on the Pahlavi version of the Home Yasht is already taking shape. Now tonight, Mehabod is going to share with, uh, with us some of the insights he has gained from working with on the Home Yasht, on the Avestan Home Yasht and on its interpretation in the Middle Persian texts. Mehabod, I invite you to give the 25th Kuta Memorial Lecture on Understanding the Avesta, Zoroastrian Scholastic Activities in the 9th to 11th Centuries and the Creation of Avestan Pahlavi Bilingual Manuscripts. Thank you very much. Many thanks, Professor Hinze, for your very kind and generous introduction. I hope to be able to live up to it. Uh, also, with working with you has been a tremendous uh, honor and privilege for me. If I'm here, it's because of your uh, unwavering support and generosity. Thank you so much. Also, thank you all for coming here. And I would also like to thank uh, the Kutar family for establishing uh, the Kutar Memorial Lecture Series. Today, I chose a story which I would like to share with you. My story is about the creation of the first and second known bilingual Avestan Pahlavi manuscripts, figures involved in its, in its creation, and reasons for its uh, creation based on my thoughts and investigations. I selected this topic due to the presence of a significant colophon, or scribes' notes, in these manuscripts offering invaluable historical insight into Zoroastrian scholarly activities during the early Islamic period. As will be discussed, a team of Zoroastrian learned figures from various cities uh, collaborated together to produce this manuscript, which contains the Avestan text of the Yasna and its Pahlavi version. This collaborative effort bears resemblance to contemporary teamwork dynamics within academia. Furthermore, I suggest that this manuscript was not merely a combined version of its older Avestan and Pahlavi texts. Rather, I suggest that this manuscript was resulted from a Zoroastrian revisionist movement of the, early, of the 11th century, which encompassed the reform of the calendar and the ritual performance of the Yasta. However, the first question one may ask is, OK, so what is the Yasna ceremony? What are Avestan and Middle Persian languages? Since I begin with a short discussion on the Yasna as a ceremony and the language of its ceremony, that is, Avestan. During the Sasanian er and early Islamic periods, translations and commentaries of, this, of some Avestan texts, including that of the Yasna, were also created in another language called Middle Persian. Therefore, I also touch upon the history of this language. The Yasna stands at the cornerstone ritual of the main religion of pre-Islamic Iran or Zoroastrianism performed within sanctified confines of a fire temple marked by pharaohs at sunrise. The solemn rite is presided by two priests, one as the main and the other one as the assistant priest. During the ceremony, the priests recite the text of the Yasna in Avestan while performing ritual acts. With origins tracing back to the Indo-Iranian period, the Yasna embodies an ancient legacy of profound significance. 
Regrettably, this invaluable facet of human intangible cultural legacy faces the threat of extinction. Amidst this concern, uh, the good news is that the, the Yasta ceremony as performed in India was recorded in 2017 by the Muya project led by Professor Almut Hinson. For those, eager, for those eager to delve deeper into this rich tradition, the complete ceremony is accessible online at muya.soas.ac.uk. This film is also accompanied by annotations on ritual elements and gesture. So this photo here captures a moment during the performance of the Yasna ceremony. As you see, the ceremony is uh, performed inside a space uh, separated from the outside by these pharaohs, and two priests uh, perform the ritual. So the assistant priest here, sorry, the chief priest here, and the assistant priest who passed, uh, sadly passed away a few years ago. Also, as I said, this, uh, the, the ceremony involves the recitation of the, Aves, of the uh, Yasna in Avesta, accompanied by ritual acts. You also see some ritual elements here in this photo. The oldest Zoroastrian texts, including that of the Yasna, are composed in an old Iranian language called Avesta. The Avestan text of the Yasna witnesses to different stages of the language, while the old Avestan texts, including the Gathas of Zarathustra, were presumably composed in the second half of the second millennium BCE, the composition of younger Avestan belongs to a later stage of the language, starting from the late second or early first millennium BCE. Regarding the arrangement of the Yasna, the old Avestan texts, including the Gathas, are placed at the center of the Yasna and flanked on either side by their young Avestan counterparts. Possibly during the late Sasanian period, an authoritative priest or a council of high priests was tasked with inventing a precise phonetic script. The aim of the invention of this script, traditionally referred to as the Dendibiri, or the script of the religion was to reflect the exact pronunciation of words according to the accepted method of Sasanian, uh, accepted method or standards of the official Sasanian priesthood. Moreover, during the Sasanian and early Islamic periods, Zoroastrian priests translated and commented on the Yasna in Middle Persian, an Iranian language originated from the province of Pars or Persia the homeland of, of the Sasanians. Middle Persian also served as the lingua franca or language of communication of the Sasanian empire. Middle Persian is also the ancestor language of new or Dari Persian spoken mainly in modern day Iran, Tajikistan, and Afghanistan. In addition to Zoroastrians, Manichaean and Christians uh, also produced their texts in Middle Persia. Scholars have mainly employed the term Pahlavi for the Zoroastrian Middle Persian text, a convention I also adopted here. So in this slide, you see the timeline of the development of Avestan and Middle Persia. Also, as I said, uh, in the second half of the Sasanian period, the Avestan script was invented. You see here an example of this very accurate script, and as you see, each word is separated by its uh, preceding and following words by a dot. So uh, the history of interpreting of the Avesta is ancient, dating back to the Avestan period. For example, it is well known that Yasna 19, 20, and 21, there are three chapters of the Yasna of 72 chapters, serve as commentaries on the famous Ahunavar, Hashem Vohu, and Yeng Hehatan prayers, respectively. Furthermore, evidence, further evidence supporting the antiquity of Zoroastrian interpretive traditions is again found in the Avesta, 
where the Avestan term mat azainti, meaning with explanations, is used for the interpretations on the gathas. The ancient Zoroastrian interpretive tradition was passed down to priests of the Sasanian and early Islamic periods. They translated and commented on the Yasna, including the, the, Aves, uh, the, including the Yasna in their own language, that is Pahlavi, as just mentioned. This interpretive tr tradition was initially oral. However, possibly from the late Sasanian period, written tradition also emerged alongside its uh, oral counterpart. The oldest historically datable manuscript is a lost bilingual Avestan Pahlavi Codex of the Yasna, which is the, to uh, which is the topic of today's discussion. Before delving into that, I believe an overview of codicology uh, of the Yasna manuscripts is required. So manuscripts carrying the text of the Yasna are divided into two groups. One is Sade or simple here. These manuscripts provide the Avestan recitation text of the Yasna and the ritual instructions, which may be in Pahlavi, New Persian, or Gujarati. So you see here an example of a Sade manuscript here. As you see, uh, uh, Avestan, the Avestan section, the, Aves, the Avestan text of the Yasna is followed by its ritual direction in, uh, here in uh, Pahlavi, written in red ink. So in, these ritual directions can be either, for example, on the number uh, that a certain text should be recited or on uh, uh, ritual acts. By contrast, Exegetical manuscripts not only feature the original Avestan text of the Yasna, but also incorporate translations and commentaries in Pahlavi. So here also you see a Pahlavi manuscript here. So short sec so Avestan is followed by its Pahlavi uh, translation or commentary. Sanskrit, Sanskrit translations and commentaries of the Yasna were also created by, by the Parsis in India based on a Pahlavi Yasna. However, as previously mentioned, the emphasis of the present discussion will be on the exegetical uh, manuscripts written in Pahlavi. Based on their origin, the Pahlavi Yasna codices are traditionally categorized in two groups. Here you see Iranian and Indian. Although the, the extant uh, Iranian Pahlavi Asna manuscripts were written in India, they contain an important colophon confirming that they descend from an Iranian manuscript. Furthermore, the Indian Pahlavi Asna manuscripts closely related to their Indian, Iranian counterparts originated from Iran. Since both classes of manuscripts are ultimately Iranian, these terminologies are problematic in strict sense. Therefore, there is a recent scholarly trend to designate the Iranian Pahlavi Yasna manuscripts and their Iran Indian counterparts as the combined manuscripts and the Pahlavi Yasna manuscripts re respectively, following Professor Contreras' suggestion. Prof uh, Professor Contreras' reason for his suggestion is that in addition to the Avestan original and its Pahlavi version, the Iranian manuscripts also offer ritual directions, a feature mainly found in the Sade manuscripts. So you see here, in this Pahlavi manuscript, we also find ritual directions. While we expect to see these ritual directions in a Sade manuscript, not in a manuscript which, con which uh, contains the Pahlavi version of the Yasna or a manuscript which is uh, uh, written for uh, the learned uh, priestly cycle, uh, circles. However, I would like to mention here that I personally disagree with these new terminologies, especially the combined manuscripts. The reason is that ritual directions are also found in the, Iran, in, in the Indian Pahlavi Yasna and Sanskrit, Sanskrit copies, although less frequently. Hence, I have proposed new terminologies in my forthcoming book. Uh, however, in the present talk, I decided to employ the traditional uh, terms. 
I should also mention that uh, Professor Contero is also aware of the existence of which fall directions in the Pahlavi, uh, Indian Pahlavi Asno manuscripts. However, these uh, terminologies have been accepted by researchers and scholars. The Pahlavi version of the Yasna and other Avestan texts present interesting features, notably the translation appro uh, approach adopted for the Avestan text by Pahlavi speaking interpreters of the Avesta is distinctive, as it involves a word for word translation technique. This means that the syntax of the Pahlavi version mirrors, mirrors that of its Avestan counterpart. In other words, the word order of the Pahlavi version follows that of its Avestan original. Furthermore, the Pahlavi version may contain commentaries or glosses on the Avesta. Commentators' names are also sometimes mentioned. So I tried to tra show the translation technique in these two tables. Each Avestan word has uh, a counterpart in the Pahlavi version, and the order uh, of the Pahlavi version follows that of the Avesta. How do we know a uh, commentary section begins? Uh, begins uh, so uh, it's relatively straightforward. So when we see that a Pahlavi word or Pahlavi words uh, do not have an Ave uh, Avestan counterparts, it means that uh, these words belong to the commentary section. As I said, we also sometimes see the names of uh, commentators of these uh, texts. So in this slide, you see the actual representation of the Avestan Pahlavi text in a real manuscript. So short sections of the Avesta, here, for example, here, are followed by its Pahlavi, oh, here, short section of the uh, of Avesta is followed by its corresponding Pahlavi translation and commentary. So we know that so up to this part, we have the translation. So the last word here, Pus, corresponds to Pustro, son in Avesta. So the remaining words are, belong to the commentary section. So as mentioned at the beginning of the talk, a reason for the importance of the Iranian Pahlavi Yasna manuscripts lies in the fact that they contain two colophons embedded in their long introduction, in the introduction section, extending over several folios, which precedes the beginning of the text of the Yasna proper. The first colophon is immediately followed by the second one, which recounts the story of how the first and second known bilingual Avestan Pahlavi Yasna manuscript was created. So uh, I, uh, I spoke about the features of this manuscript, so the Avestan and Pahlavi features of this manuscript. So as I said, I just uh, repeat myself, a class of these manuscripts are called Iranian Pahlavi Yasna manuscripts. And they have a uh, long introduction. In the middle of the, their introduction, two colophons uh, appear. And so the second, so colophon one is followed by colophon two. And colophon two is very important because it uh, uh, writes the story of the creation of the first and second known bilingual Avestan Pahlavi uh, manuscript. Based on my knowledge, from the late 19th century until 2005, prof professors West, Dabar, Tavadia, Mazdapur, and Contero and Devan studied either the colophons or the entire introduction. However, there are several scholarly disagreements regarding the interpretation of these colophons. These disagreements mainly concern the scribes of the colophon text, 
the name of the creator of the first Pahlavi Yasna manuscript and the point of transmission between the first and second colophon and the scribes of the Avestan and Pahlavi sources of the original bilingual manuscript. Professor Mazdapur explains the problem in the following words. Because of the ambiguity that exists in the writing, borders between the sentences cannot be distinguished clearly. And as a result, one can reach a different semantic conclusion with revisions in these transitional points. Having critically reviewed the past scholarship and also benefited from uh, the aforementioned scholarly suggestions, I published an article at the Bulletin of SOAS in which I suggest this genealogical relationship you see in the slide. Based on this model, Rostam, son of Dador Mast, from the town of Varzanag, in the land of Sepahan or modern day Esfahan, produced the first bilingual Avestan Pahlavi manuscript whose Pahlavi source was from the manuscript of Farbai Surushayar, who possibly, possibly hailed from the town of Kazerun in Pars or Persia. Rostam's manuscript was then copied by Mahvendad, who at least lived in Baghdad for some time. So here we have Rostam, son of Dad or Maz. So he was from the town of Arzanak. He produced the first known bilingual manuscript. We don't know uh, the scribe of, his, uh, of the source of his Avestan uh, text. But however, his uh, uh, Pahlavi text goes back to, uh, to the Pahlavi text written by Farbai Surushayar. Please let me read the colophon text. The young Rostam, son of Dad or Mast, from the blessed land of Sepahan or Esfahan, from the road dashed region, from the town of Warzanak, had written a copy. The Avesta, the Avesta from a copy, and the Zan, Zan means translations and commentaries of the Avesta, from the, uh, from the copy of the immortal far by Surushayar, for himself, and for the immortal soul, Mahyar, son of Farrukhzad, from the same Bishapur province, from the region of Kazerun. So uh, Bishapur was uh, an administrative region uh, of uh, Pars, and Kazerun was a city of this, uh, in, in this region, i.e. Bishapur. So I, the immortal, Mahvendad, son of Narmahan, son of Vahram Mehr, wrote from the same copy, a copy at the request of the victorious Abu Nasr Mard Shad, son of Shapur, from the blessed land of Shiraz, and Shiraz is also in Pars. In the remaining time, I would like to talk about the figures whose name occur in this text. The first figure is Farbai Surushayar. According to this colophon, although the Avestan source of the first known bilingual Avestan Pahlavi manuscript remains unspecified, its Pahlavi version was copied from Farbai Surushayar's manuscript. Moreover, this colophon possibly indirectly identifies Farbai Surushayar's city as Kazerun. The reason is that the term same in the colophon likely pertains to Farbai city. Now the question arises whether or not we can identify Farbai Surushayar. In an article in Persian, Dr. Hamid Reza Dalvand identifies Farbai Surushayar with Farbai Surush whose name appears in a Pahlavi Revoyat. Dr. Dalvan does not provide a detailed investigation to support his suggestion, 
as the focus of his article was on a different subject. However, I believe this identification is significant and could contribute to the solution of the mystery surrounding the creation of the Pahlavi Yasna manuscripts. Before in delving into the discussion uh, on Farbay Surushayar and his identification, it's however necessary to briefly examine a reformist movement in which Farbay Surushayar played an important role. This movement, which aimed to reform the calendar and the performance of the Yasta ceremony occurred in the early 11th century. The Zoroastrian calendar is an intricate topic, much like many other aspects of Zoroastrianism. In addition, a detailed discussion on the calendar is beyond the scope of the present talk as well as my personal expertise. If you're interested, interested in this topic, I recommend reading articles by scholars such as the late Sayyid Hassan Taghizadeh, Prof, uh, Professor Mary Boyce, and Professor Francois de Blois. Professor Hintze has also published an article on the pre accumulated solar Zoroastrian calendar. In summary, the Zoroastrian calendar ad, uh, adopted during the mid accumulated period consisted of 12 months of 30 days, supplemented by five intercalary or in, uh, complementary days, which were originally placed, these five days, after the 12 month, or Esfand. Therefore, the Zoroastrian year, beginning with the month Fravardin, has totally 365 days, a quarter day shorter than the solar year. Consequently, the calendar gradually moved forward in relation to the solar year. Zoroastrians probably moved the, so the five intercalary days from the end of the 12th month, or Esfand, to the end of the 8th month, or Aban, in around 500 CE, or of the Common Era, when the beginning of the 9th month, i.e. Azar, fell at the spring equinox. However, in year 375 of the Yazdgerd era, or 1006 of the Common Era, the first day of Fravardin again fell, fell at the spring equinox, as stated by the polymath Biruni and the astronomer Kushyar, Zoroastrians of Western Iran revised the calendar and moved the intercalary days to the end of the uh, month Esfand again. So let me read Kushyar's text for you. When 120 years after the time of Anushiravan has passed, it was the end of the reign of, of the Persians, the disruption of their government, and the beginning of the domination of Arabs over them. The five days remained at the end of the month Aban, or the eighth, eighth month, until the year 375 of the Yazjird era when the sun entered Aries on the first day of the month of Farvardin, we have been informed that in Fars or Persia and those areas near it, the five days were removed to the end of the month of Esfand or Mad or Esfand according to the ancient tradition. Can I move? This revision is also documented in a Pahlavi text completed in 377 of the Yazgird era, or 1008 of the Common Era. The text is associated with Far by Srosh. It's a letter, to, I mean this Pahlavi Rawayat, is a letter about the Zoroastrians of Abar Shahr, or Neishabur, located in Khorasan province in the northeast of Iran about the reform in the aforementioned calendar. The text also informs us that this reform included the way the Yasna ceremony was performed. While the residents of the city accepted the, refor the reform, a student rejects it. The student claims that although he has, been, uh, he has seen the priest far by Sorosh, 
and explanation sent by a person, namely Abu Miswar or, or Abu Mansur, Yazdan Fadar Marzban, he or the student does not know how the reform have been, uh, reforms have been made. After receiving the letter of Abu Miswar, explaining that they have seen the reforms in the Avesta and that the leader of Zoroastrians accepted it, the student accuses Abu Miswar, who was a man of the royal administration, of having no knowledge about the religion. The Rawayat continues with the Mubat, or Farbai, defending Abu Miswar. Following Kushyar's report, which states that Zoroastrians of Fars and its neighboring regions initiated the reform, it's reasonable to assume Farbai Sroj in the Pahlavi Rawayat was from this region or area. As already stated, based on the second colophon of the Iranian Pahlavi Asna manuscripts, it can uh, also be inferred that Farbai Sroshyar was from Kazerun, or areas near Pars. Furthermore, in the colophon of the Iranian Pahlavi Yasna manuscripts, Farbai Sroshyar carries the descriptor Anushag here, meaning uh, immortal, rather than Anushag Ruwan, of immortal soul. used for deceased people in post-Islamic Iran. This suggests that Farbai Surushayar was alive when Mahvendad, the scribe of the, second, uh, of the second colophon, wrote his manuscript in the early 11th century, as we will see soon. Therefore, the Farbai Surush of the Pahlavi Ravayat and Farbai Surushayar, the author of the Pahlavi version of the Yasna, must have lived at the same period. Both figures were also high-ranking priests, since Farbai Srosh is described as a Mubed, while Farbai Sroshayar had written a Pahlavi manuscript, a task typically undertaken by learned priests. Furthermore, as report, uh, as stated in the aforementioned Pahlavi Rivayat, Farbai Srosh revised the ritual, direction, ritual acts or directions of the Yasna ceremony. It appears that ritual directions of the Pahlavi Yasna manuscripts, which appear after the Pahlavi Yasna rather than the Avestan original, belongs to Farbai Srosh's Pahlavi manuscript. The association is supported by a Pahlavi text found at the beginning of the Pahlavi Yasna which refers to the manuscript text, uh, to the manuscripts of this class as Avestag, Abog, Zand, or Nerang. Avesta together with Zand and ritual directions. So let me explain it in other words. So usually in manuscripts, in the Sada manuscript, the Avestan text is followed by its uh, ritual direction. However, this, this situation is different in the Pahlavi manuscripts. So we have the Avestan text, we have the Pahlavi version, and we have the ritual directions. So we expect to see the ritual directions after the Pahlavi version, rather than after the Avestan version, rather than the Pahlavi version. And also we know that these manuscripts also call them uh, in, uh, themselves as um, the manuscripts of the Avestag, Abog, Zand, or Nerang. So the Avesta together with Zand and Nerang. So it shows that the path, these uh, ritual instru instructions belong to the, manu to the Pahlavi uh, text of Farbai Srushayar. So uh, who we think uh, revised uh, uh, these uh, ritual directions. In conclusion, it is unlikely that two different learned high priests with the same name, i.e. Farbai, and the same father's name with a minor variation, i.e. Srosh or Sroshayar, also from the same region, existed at the same time. Hence, it can be suggested that Farbai Srosh, Sroshayar wrote the Pahlavi version accompanied by ritual directions 
to provide his understanding of the yasna and to introduce reforms to the performance of the yasna. So the next figure in this important colophon is Rostam Dado Mast, who produced the first bilingual Avestan Pahlavi manuscript. According to the colophon, he hailed from the land of Sepahan, in, or modern day Isfahan, from the town of Warzanag. It might worth adding that Professor Mazdapur was the only scholar who correctly read the name of Varzanag, while other aforementioned scholars uh, read it as Varju with minor variations. So this is the um, so uh, this uh, is due to the ambiguity of the Pahlavi characters. So I just included the word for the uh, use uh, of this city. So as uh, in Pahlavi. Uh, some uh, characters can represent different, uh, different sounds. Uh, and I think this adds to the joy of working on Pahlavi, because you have to know the word in order to be able uh, to read uh, uh, Pahlavi, unlike the Avesta, if you do not know anything from the Avesta and only you know the uh, alphabet or uh, Avestan script, you can easily uh, read the entire Avesta. So, it seems that Varzanag, or Varzane in Persian, was a stronghold of Zoroastrianism in older times. So this is the city of uh, Rostam Dad or Mast. Although I, am of, uh, although I am unaware of any other texts referring to Zoroastrians of Varzanag, it might worth mentioning that traditional women of this city still wear white chadors, a loose garment covering the body. In contrast to black chadors worn by traditional or religious women of other cities. This has been associated with the original, with the Zoroastrian tradition of wearing white clothes. According to second colophon, Mahvendat Narm, so I'm just I'm talking about another figure in this colophon, who is Mahvendat Narmohan. Mahvendat Narmohan copied the first bilingual Avestan Pahlavi manuscript produced by Rostam. In other words, he uh, copied Rostam's manuscript. He was also the author of the introduction section in the Pahlavi Asna manuscripts. In addition, he was a copist of a manuscript of the Den Kard. So, and, and of the famous Pahlavi book called the Den Kard. From his colophon, in the manuscript of the Den Kard, we know that in 1029 of the Common Era, he lived in Baghdad, where he visited the office of Hudenon Peshobai, meaning the leader or vanguard of the followers of good religion or Zoroastrians and its archive. I can imagine that some may not be aware of the existence of the Zoroastrian leadership office in Baghdad. In summary, this office existed in this city from the early Abbasid period until at least the first half of the 11th century. There is, all, there is no information of this office after this period. We also know the names of holders of this office, such as Adur Farbai, who wrote the Den Kard in the 9th century. If you are interested in this topic, Professor Albert de Jong and Professor Kianush, Professor Kianush Rezania have recently published articles on the Zoroastrians of Baghdad and the office of Hudenon Pishobai, respectively. Furthermore, I cautiously suggest that Mahvendad Narmohan was not solely a simple scribe. Rather, he was probably a Pahlavi commentator, as his name appears in Farbai's Pahlavi Yasta. Another commentator was probably Dado Mast, Rostam's father. Here, you see stanzas here. Okay, here. Here, you see stanzas in which their names occur together as the Pahlavi commentators. 
Interestingly, the names, uh, uh, the, uh, the names of Mahvendat and Dadurmaz and their commentaries are absent from the Sanskrit Yasna. This could indicate that this, these commentaries did not exist in the last Pahlavi source of the Sanskrit Yasna, whose, uh, which according to Kantera go back to a different tradition. As a result, Mahvendad and Dadurmaz in these stanzas may not be associated with earlier authoritative commentators with the same names who were rec recognized by different interpretive traditions. Therefore, this feature could be another piece of evidence corroborating the suggestion that Farbai's manuscript offers a revised version of the Pahlavi Yasna and the method of the performance of the Yasna ritual by including commentaries of the commentators of the revisionist circle on certain passages of the Yasna alongside the ritual directions. So, so I just come back to, the, to our uh, model and to s review uh, what I have said so far. So Rostam, son of Dador Mast, produced the first manuscript. The source of his Pah uh, Pahlavi text, so the, produced the first bilingual manuscript, and he was from Varzanag. The source of his uh, Pahlavi version, probably accompanied by commentaries, was uh, the text of Farbai Surushayar, who was possibly from Kazerun. And this manuscript was uh, copied by Mahvendad Narmahan. At least we know that in 1029, he lived in Baghdad. So two other figures remain. One is Mahyar Farrokhzad, and the other one is Abu Nasr Mard Shad. Mahyar, according to the second colophon, was from the region uh, from Kazerun. However, he did not have a role in the creation of the bilingual Avestan Pahlavi manuscripts. But Rost, uh, Rostam wrote his manuscript for the sake of himself and the immortal soul or deceased Mahayar Farrokhzad. Tawadiya suggests that Mahayar Farrokhzad could have been Adur, ba Adur Farbai's brother, the famous leader of Zoroastrians in the 9th century about whom I briefly talked. If so, it shows that although Adur Farbai was living in Baghdad as the leader of Zoroastrians in the early 9th century, he was originally from Kazerun. Or, uh, unfortunately, I don't have evidence to confirm or reject Havadiyah's suggestion. So, based on the second colophon, Abu Nasr from Shiraz in Pars requested Mahvinda to produce a copy of Rostam's bilingual manuscript. Although Abu Nas bears an Arabic kunya, meaning the father of Nas, he, he must have been a Zoroastrian. Otherwise, one should explain why a Muslim requested the production of an Avestan manuscript. Likewise, in the text of the Pahlavi Rivayat of, of Farbai Surush, the name of another Zoroastrian i.e. Abu Meswar, with the Arabic kunya occurs. He is described as a man with uh, a royal administration role. In conclusion, I suggest that the first bilingual Avestan Pahlavi manuscript was the, the result of a teamwork of Zoroastrians from Varzanag in Esfahan, Kazerun in Pars or areas near it, Shiraz in Pars, and possibly Baghdad to provide a revised version of the Yasna and its ritual directions. This occurred in the early 11th century when Zoroastrians of Pars and areas around it decided to revise the calendar and the performance of the Yasna. This suggestion finds further support from the introduction of the Iranian Pahlavi Yasna manuscripts where it scribes, it scribes sorry, or Mahvendat declares that he wrote the Avestan Yasna and its Zand, or uh, 
translation and commentaries uh, with explanations, chapter by chapter, section by section in Avestan as it seemed better and superior. I hope you are not very bored and bear with me for a few more minutes as I briefly talk about the first colophon and, later, and the later transmission of this class of manuscripts. So according to the first colophon, uh, a copy of this class of manuscripts was copied by Mahvendad Azad Mar from Kazerun. But we don't know exactly when the, where the first and second copies were kept, but at least we know a, a copy was deposited in Kazerun, probably, of course. And then this, man, uh, this manuscript was copied by Mehrab, Mehraban Sependiat. The, the, the first colophon does not uh, write anything about the city from uh, which Mehraban uh, hailed. However, from other city, uh, texts, we know that he was from Dazuk in Sistan. Then his manuscript was copied by uh, Ho Shang Siavash in the late 15th century. And Ho Shang, again, from other texts, we know that Ho Shang was from Sharifabad or later Sharifabad in Yazd. So we can think that for example, a copy was kept original, uh, an early copy was, in, uh, one in, was kept in Kazerun. Uh, uh, then it went all the way to Sistan in Dazuk, and from Dazuk the text traveled to here in Sharifabad, Yazd. What happened next, we don't know, but I think, so I have some reasons for this, but uh, we don't, unfortunately we don't have time to discuss them. This manuscript uh, went, to, so a copy of this went to Kerman, and from Kerman, it was brought to by uh, Dastur Jamas Irani or Velayati to India. And later from this copy, uh, Indian uh, scribes, especially uh, Kavus, son of Sohrab, produced uh, copies. Uh, and we have, uh, fortunately, we have uh, uh, physical evidence of these copies. They, they, their copies are available. So, this was my talk. I'm very grateful and thankful to you for listening, and I look forward to hearing your uh, questions or comments or criticisms. Thank you so much. <laughs>